so this morning we're gonna be honing in on simply loving God. According to Jesus, this is the single most important command for you to do that there is, is to love him. Let me say that one more time because I don't want you to miss it. It's not just words. This is the single most important command for you to follow through on is to love him. It's not something we just simply throw together in another paragraph with something else and just assume that it's going to happen. In fact, I want you to do, do something for me. Open your Bibles up to Matthew chapter 22. Take your Bible and open up to Matthew chapter 22. Now there in, in, in the chapter, Jesus has an interaction with a lawyer. And this lawyer actually sets out at the beginning here to try to sort of stump Jesus, put him into a bad spot, make an answer that people will sort of argue about a little bit and everything. So he asks him this question. He says, teacher, verse 36, teacher, which is the great command in the law? Well, Jesus, because he's brilliant, answers and he quotes from Deuteronomy chapter six, verse five, and he said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. Now, here's what he did. He answered the question there in verse 37. It's done. Here's the question, here's the answer, but Jesus doesn't stop there. In verse 38, he takes it even a step further and adds on to it to the importance, and he says, this is the great and first commandment. Love for God needs to be priority number one. It is the great and first commandment. No one, no thing can be at that level. Jesus told us that in Luke chapter four, verse eight. He says, you shall worship the Lord your God and him only. It is the first of the 10 commandments that no one is to be in front of him. The problem is, is that whenever we start talking about love, like love God, love people there, that word love is um, kind of a flippant concept with us. We use it way too often. We use it about way too many things, way too easily. Let me give you an example. If I said I love the Lord, I think most of you would go, yeah, amen, all right, that's good. That's the way it should be, right? I love my wife, oh yeah, good, we like that. That's really good. I love my kids and my grandkids and my parents, yep. All those things are good. But the whole idea of love can go progressively shallower really fast. For example, if I stop and go, I love the beach. All of you would go, yeah, that's great. Who doesn't love the beach? But is that on the same level as loving God? I love baseball. I mean, I do. I know some of you are going, well, it's slow. Well, I don't care. I like slow, okay? Um, I love bacon. If you can't say amen to that, seriously, you need a transplant of your taste buds, okay? Um, but it gets even shallower than that. It doesn't take very long. I mean, I can get in my car and drive out, and if I see a Popeyes, I'm going, man, I'd like to have one of those chicken sandwiches. Right, I love a chicken sandwich. You know, I love rock candy. It's just sugar. I mean, I, it cannot possibly be on the same level, me saying those things, as I love on, as I say, love my wife, or I love who God is. And yet, we don't have another word for that. We tend to seemingly prioritize everything the same, and they're not the same. Our love for Jesus should be above everything else. Nothing can be its equal. In fact, turn in your Bibles over to Mark chapter 12. Mark chapter 12. Now in Mark 12, 30, Jesus is going to give a very simple phrase that he's gonna repeat four times. Now the fact that he repeats it tells you it's pretty important. But at the end of it, he's gonna use a noun, a different noun each time to describe what he really means when he's talking about loving him. He says this, and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. In other words, nothing should compare to my love for him. Nothing. Why? Because it's supernatural. It's not a love you're born with. You didn't come out of the hospital with that love, but it is a love you were born again with. Love for God is a part of our spiritual birth. 
Jesus told us that in 1 John chapter four. He said, beloved, let us love one another for love is from God and whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. And so love for him is supposed to be my priority. It should be your priority. My fear though this morning is that you will just simply stop it in a very nice way. You'll shake your head. Yep, that's really the case, but it will not have an effect at all on your passion or your desire to really love God. And it should. Listen to the, the things here he says in Matthew chapter 12. First of all, he says we are to love God with all of your heart. The heart here is the center of our emotions. You know, emotions, whether you know this or not, push us. That's what that word means. To emote is to move you. So like if you're driving along, somebody cuts you off, you get angry, your emotions rise up, it moves you towards anger. In this case, we're to love God with all of our hearts. In other words, that emotion should move me to love Jesus more. I cannot be half-hearted here spiritually. It cannot be I just like God. Or, you know, the kids are a certain age. I think maybe we should just start coming to church and just, you know, kind of check God out, you know, and be respectful to God. You know, I kind of think he's cool. No. I am to love him with an undivided heart. Now, why does he say with all your heart? Because 80% is not good enough. Can you imagine thinking that you would settle for 80%? What if your spouse said to you, hey, listen, I'm, I'm committed to you 80%? Or your children, just needing to know that you're there and you look at your children and go, hey, I'm, I'm totally behind you 80%. No. Why in the world would we think God would settle for 80% of our heart? The passage there says you were to love God with all your heart or otherwise it's not a real love. Now the second thing he says here is you're supposed to love God with all your soul. Biblically the soul is the inner man. It's the center of my affections. It is the part of me that compels me to worship someone or something. My soul defines who I am as a person. And so to love God with my whole soul is to love him with all that I am. David describes this in an incredibly picturesque way what it really means to to love God. In Psalm 42, verses one and two, he says, as the deer pants for the flowing streams, so my soul pants for you, O God. Now let me see if I can explain this because this is a really significant metaphor that he gives here. Really important picture. How many of you, how many of you like to hunt? Any hunters here? Okay, few, few hunters here. Okay, for the rest of you, do you like animal shows at all? Okay, well then you better pay attention because you're gonna need my help on this one, okay? Here's the thing. The reason why this is such a powerful picture here is because for the deer to go down to the water's edge makes it vulnerable. You see, that's where the predators are at. The deer knows that. The predators know that. That's where they die, right there. And the picture here that he gives is this deer that that needs a drink so badly, wants a drink so badly that it's literally panting. It's it's breathing hard. It's got this anxiety, a nervousness almost about it that it just has to have this drink. And so it risks all, it risks going through the predators to get down to the water to get that drink. And the truth is it does that every single day. David says, just like that deer does, he goes, that's the way I am with God. You know, somebody, people have asked me in the past, why do you think David was considered a man after God's own heart after that whole Bathsheba thing? Yeah, he made a mistake and he repented, but you know the truth about David is he loved Jesus so badly he had to be, he had to be with him. That's the way we're supposed to be. Every single day, it's like a panting inside of us. I have to have him. Now, I think God wants that from us. To love God with all your soul is to long for him more than you long for anything else. 
It's a trust that Jesus alone satisfies me, that I will not be satisfied in life by simply having a second home or having a brand new relationship that I walk into or getting the car of my dreams, that everything else other than Jesus will leave me wanting. In fact, you know where's a great story for that? In John chapter four, there's a story about Jesus going to a, a, a well in Samaria and sitting down next to a Samaritan woman and having an interchange with her. Now, it says there in the passage in verse four that he had to pass through Samaria. I will tell you that he was up in the Galilee and he was heading, you know, which was up high, and he was heading all the way down to Jerusalem, and normally they did not go through Samaria because the Jews and Samaritans didn't really like each other very much. So it was very typical for them to go over and go down, you know, the Jordan River, not only because a lot of people did it, but because it was easy to get water and all the other things that would go with us, but in this case, he doesn't. He stops. He stops at this well, and this woman's at the well there, and he says to her, give me a drink. She's shocked. Verse eight, she can't even understand it. Wait, wait, how is it you're asking me for a drink? And then in verse 10, he says this. Jesus answered her and he said, I know if you knew the gift of God and who it is that's saying to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. Now she stops in verses 11 and 12 and kind of takes a look at him and she's like, wait a minute, you don't have a barrel, you don't have a bucket, no rope, how are you gonna get a drink? I mean, are you somehow greater than our father Jacob was? Verse 13, Jesus says to her, everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never be thirsty again. Let me translate that for you. Every other thing other than me will leave you thirsty, will not satisfy, will not satisfy you. It's a powerful metaphor for the the fact that we only find our true satisfaction in Jesus. Every other satisfaction in this life is temporary. Now, the third thing he says here is we're supposed to love God with all your mind. The biblical meaning of of mind is intellect. It's my thoughts. In other words, I can't just love God with my emotions. I also have to give him my mind and, and my intellect. I need to be thinking about the deep thoughts of God, the truths of who he is, and marvel at them. There's an amazing picture of this in Isaiah chapter six. God gives the prophet Isaiah This unbelievably rare privilege he allows him to see into heaven. And all of a sudden, it's like the doors open right up and here's Jesus. And the train of his robe fills the temple and smoke is everywhere and he is just in awe. And his only response is, whoa. That is the perfect response. It, it's, it's incredibly perfect. I mean, it's, it's the exact right response. Because remember last week, Thomas mentioned to you, he says, doctrine should lead to doxology. Do you know what that really means? Doxology, if you just break the word down, doxa is a Latin term, which means magnificent or glorious. And ology comes from the word logos. It means words. It means that when we study God's word, when we look inside God's word, it ought to lead to us speaking or singing words that declare the majesty and the glory of God. That's what should happen. There should never be a time when I open up God's word that I'm not going, wow. See, we don't stop and just read God's word so we can collect knowledge. It's one of the first things I remember when I first went off to Bible college before seminary is the first thing he said, there's only one reason to study God's word, to apply it to your life. If you're studying it just so you can put it up here, you are not doing right. It should make a difference. It should challenge us. It should you know, cause us to think deeper thoughts about who our God is. To love God is to recognize how really good he is. Psalm 34 eight tells us, oh, oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. That's what happens when we get into the word. To know God 
is to love him. And to love him is to worship him. The fourth thing he says here is love God with all your strength. To love with our strength is to love with our actions. It's what we do. It's how we live. It's what we spend our time on, our, 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 our energy on, our finance, all those things on. Loving God with all your strength is not a passive thing. You know, I don't know where you're at, you know, personally, spiritually, but I will tell you that if you've grown passive spiritually, maybe another word would be apathetic spiritually, it's time for you to renew your love to Jesus. Look, we're not saved by what we do. But what we do reveals what our hearts are excited about. It reveals what we love. So here's a good question. Why is it that we lose that passion for Jesus? That desire maybe that we had at one time? I will tell you what my, I think the answer is. I think that somehow we start noticing our old flame again, the world. And because everybody else is into that, we go back to it. We just go back to it. You know where you get that from? In Ephesians chapter two, verses one through three. In fact, Ephesians chapter two, the whole chapter there is probably one of the most important chapters in all of the scriptures. The beginning, of it, it describes to us exactly who you and I were before we came to faith in Christ. And it tells us that there was a time that you and I, he says, you were dead in your trespasses and sins. In other words, before you came to faith in Jesus spiritually, you were dead. Walking around, I mean, doing all your things, you know, that you wanted to do. But during that time, it says that you were following the course of the world, following the prince of the power of the air. In other words, you did, had no love. Love for God did not play into your equation at all. You loved people and stuff and fun and yourself, and that was it. And then all of a sudden, you come to Jesus, and it's supposed to change. Even now, I, you know, when I look at my own life, and I've been a believer since I was 14 years old, when my love for Christ begins to wane right now, it is normally because for some reason, I started loving the things around me too much. You know, when God, in his mercy, drew me to himself at 14, I heard the gospel, I responded. Um, he implanted his Holy Spirit inside of me to lead me, to help me walk and live this life, to honor him. I mean, it's a transforming thing. I'm called now not to love the world. John, the apostle, told us the same thing in 1 John 2.15, do not love the world. And yet it's so easy for us to do. Blaise Pascal, who was a scientist and an artist and, and everything, he, he once said that, you know, that we were all created with this God-shaped void in our lives that only God himself can fill, and yet we tend to try to fill it with everything else. You know, I'll just be happy if I have the right, you know, relationship here on earth or if I have the right job or I live in the right area or, you know, I, I make this certain amount of money so I can go do these things. I'm going to be happy, and those things are not going to provide satisfaction to you because you'll always want something else. To love God is to stop trying to fill my soul with that which doesn't satisfy and find my satisfaction in him. Love for Jesus is more than simply saying I love you in a song once a week. It's not missing my opportunities. Sometimes I, I, I express my love in words and prayer. Sometimes it's singing as, as we do when we come together jointly like that. Other times it's maybe simply stopping and listening to the Lord and reflecting on really what he has to say and, and who he is like Martha's sister Mary did in Luke chapter 10 when she sat at Jesus' feet and just listened. You know, I don't know if you can think back, was there a time maybe when spiritually you felt like you loved Jesus more than even right now? 
Let me give you some practical ways to sort of get back to that. One is you need to spend time in the word because it will change my desires. Listen to what Psalm 19 says, starting in verse seven. It says, the law of the Lord is perfect. Well, why is it perfect? Well, verse seven says, because it revives the soul. It says, it makes wise the simple. I wrote down here, that's me, because I wanted to remind myself that I'm kind of a simple-minded guy. So, I mean, that's me. It makes me wise. Verse eight, it it says that it, it causes rejoicing in the heart. It enlightens my eyes. And then verse nine tells me why the truth of God is so important. It says, it's more to be desired than gold, even much fine gold, sweeter than also honey and the drippings of the honeycomb. So I need to be in the word, but I also need to be in prayer. You know, in Jeremiah 29, there is an amazing promise from the Lord to his people who had grown cold spiritually at that point. He said, if you seek me with all your heart, I will let you find me. Do you realize what what an amazing thing that is? You understand what he's saying? The God of the universe is saying, hey, put everything aside for a minute, and if your heart is true, if you seek me, I'm I'm gonna let you find me. Let me give you an example of what that would be. Let's just say for a second you're sick. I mean, you're really sick, sick, sick. And you go to the doctor and the doctor says, hey, this is what you've got, but here's the good news. I've got something to give you and it will make you feel well. You'll be better. In fact, you'll be better than well. You're gonna feel great. And so you're so excited on the way home, you stop at the pharmacy, you know, you, 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 you get this, you know, the, the medicine and you go home and you tell your spouse, hey, this is what the doctor said, you know, and it says if I just take this, I'm gonna feel great. I, better than I felt, you know, than in a really, really long time, I'm gonna feel great. And your spouse says, oh, that's awesome. So when are you gonna take it? I don't know, maybe tomorrow, if I have time. You'd be thinking, what? Why would you not... If this can make you better, why would you not take that? And that's exactly the promise here. If you seek me with all of your heart, I'm gonna let you find me. Ari Tori, who was a, a great Bible teacher, said, if loving God with all your heart and soul and might is the greatest commandment, then it follows that not loving him that way is the greatest sin. When I trusted in Jesus, I have to tell you, I could not stop thinking about him. At 14 years old, somebody gave me a a living Bible. Remember those? It wasn't even really a Bible translation. It was like a paraphrase thing. And and I didn't know where to read, and they said, we're gonna read in one of the Gospels, and so they told me, you know, turn to this Gospel, and I didn't, I had started at the beginning. I'm going through each one, like trying to figure out where it was in there, and I, I finally go there, and I remember I didn't know anything. I mean, I didn't know what the, you know, the, the Trinity was. I didn't know what hypostatic union was. I didn't know about any of these things theologically, and nothing, and, but I would read it, and I would go, wow. He did that. There was something wonderful about that wow. I mean, are you tracking with me at all in that? Over time, I can remember I would get inundated with the the messages of the world around me what my friends loved and what they were doing and all involved. And I remember that was a hard, that's when the battles of my faith started. You know, at times we can recognize that we're on a slippery slope, that we're sort of going, you know, down, but at other times it's very difficult. That is a believer's battle. To begin to love things that I shouldn't love. You know, I'm gonna ask the worship team if they'll come back and they'll, they'll join me. The question is, how do we get back to that? Well, I already mentioned a couple of them. One is seeking him in the word. Some, the other one is seeking him in prayer. But the third one is worshiping him. You know, I, I love that, that the picture that the NIV actually has a, a, I wouldn't normally say that that's probably the best translation, but I love the translation that it has for Colossians 3, 1 and 2. It says, since you have been raised with Christ, set your heart on things above where Christ is Seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on earthly things. I love the picture there that it begins with setting your heart on things above. That which moves me 
towards Jesus. That's worship. You know, in the book of Revelation, the, the apostle John, he writes to the church there in Ephesus, and I want you to hear what he says. In fact, you know what, would you take a moment and just open up your Bible and turn over to that and follow along with it, because this is pretty important stuff here. Revelation chapter two. Revelation chapter two. First of all, let's just look at the first two verses, or yeah, we'll look two and three. We'll start with that. John writes and he says, I know your works and your toil and your patient endurance and how you cannot bear with those who are evil, but have tested those who call themselves apostles and are not and found them to be false. And I know you're enduring patiently and bearing up for my name's sake and you have not grown weary. Okay, stop for a second. That sounds like a pretty cool church. I mean, they're smart enough that they get it biblically. They recognize when people around them are making huge mistakes. They, they're able to call out those that are teaching wrong, and they're doing it all and even paying the price for it. I mean, they're, they're willing to bear up under that kind of a pressure. I mean, that sounds like a good thing, right, until you get to verse four. Because now verse four, he's gonna present a problem. He says, but I have this against you. You have abandoned the love you had at first. Wow. Verse five, he gives a solution. Remember there from where you have fallen. Repent and do the works you did at first. There's a simple little plan right there. Remember, repent, redo. Remember who you were, lost spiritually dead and that a holy God allowed his son to die for you. Repent. Repent just simply means to recognize you're wrong, ask God to forgive you and turn and walk the other way. Redo. Go back to the things you did at first the things you did when you first came to faith, how excited you were about spending time with the Lord in prayer, about getting into the word, about worshiping him. Repent, redo, but it all starts with remember. Francis Chan made a a really simple observation. He says, nothing you do in this life will ever matter unless it is about loving God and loving the people that he's made. So here's the question. What are you chasing? Because if it's anything other than Jesus, I will tell you it will not satisfy you. And if you're not seeking him, then you're not seeing him for who he really is, which means you're not worshiping him the way he really deserves. Right doctrine, true teaching ought to lead to doxology, the realization that he is marvelous and wonderful and magnificent and glorious. And I'm going to exclaim, I'm gonna say those things with my words and in song. It's time for us to come back to that. So I'm just gonna give you a moment right where you're at. Would you take a moment, would you get right with God on this? If the loves of your lives have gotten out of, like out of order, he needs to go back to number one. Would you take a moment right where you're at and do that? Father, would you move in such a way in our hearts that we'd not love the world anymore, but we would return back to that simple love for you. We'd be amazed, God, at who you are. Be amazed at what you've done for us. And we'd take you up on your offer, God, that we would seek you out. 
Lord, that's what we want. We love you, Lord. Lord, do a mighty thing in our hearts, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. This week, I wanna challenge you to do three things. Three things every single day. Would you just stop and spend some time in prayer with the Lord? The promise is if you'll seek him, he will let you find him. Secondly, will you, will you open up the word and get a glimpse of who he is and be amazed. Just be amazed at his goodness. Thirdly, would you stop and put your hearts on things above and just worship him. Don't wait till next Sunday. Spend some time this week, even if it just means you getting in your car, it means maybe you going to a back bedroom or something and turning it on and remember to tell him that you love him and watch what God does. There's gonna be a group of people that are gonna be down here. They'd love to be able to pray with you, pray for you. If you'd like that, please come. But this week, tell God how much you love him and watch him love you back. Love you all. God bless you.